right, perfect. I think we'll get started. I wanted to welcome everyone to tonight's uh, PodMed 101 series of virtual student panel with some podiatric medical students in their first year, second semester, and they have a lot of great wisdom that they wanna share with all of you. Um, I'm Carla Ronnebaum. I'm the Director of Enrollment Management and Student Services at Kent State's College of Podiatric Medicine. And we're also joined by Angela DeSables. Angela is our Associate Director of Enrollment Management at the college. Um, we'll be on to facilitate this, but it really is an opportunity to, for our attendees to hear from our first year students. So feel free um, to certainly ask questions that you have either directly to our students or in the chat, whatever you feel comfortable with. We will really focus on the transition to medical school, what our students have learned um, through this first semester and getting into second semester. Um, they just finished their first round of exams not that long ago. So they are gonna be brutally honest throughout this experience. <laughs> but I think that'll be a great perspective to have. Um, I wanna start and ask our student panelists if they don't mind, if we could have you guys introduce yourselves. If you wanna tell us maybe your name, uh, where you went to undergrad, where you're from, and then we can just go around. And Gabby, you're first on my end. So do you mind starting? Yeah, so I'm Gabby. I went to undergrad in Kent State, Ohio, or Kent State University in Kent, Ohio, and I am from Cleveland, Ohio. I only live 10 minutes away from the school, so fortunately, I can live at home with my parents for free, and I get free meals, so that's a plus. That's fantastic. The free meals is a done deal by my end. Hallie, how about you? Okay, sorry. Hi, I'm Holly. Um, I also went to Kent State for undergrad. <laughs> and I grew up in Ritztown, Ohio, which is the middle of nowhere, itty bitty town in Ohio, or like, I don't know, an hour south of Cleveland or so. Great. Excellent. And Isaac, how about you, buddy? Hey, everyone. My name is Isaac. I'm actually from Chicago, Illinois, so something different. I went to University of Illinois at Chicago, and then I got my master's in Chicago as well at Roosevelt University. Excellent. Thank you, Isaac. And Shonda, last but not least. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Um, I'm Shonda. I'm also a first year, and I went to undergrad at Heidelberg University in Tiffin, Ohio, and then I got my master's from Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., um, and I'm from a very tiny village here in Ohio called West Liberty. Perfect. Excellent. Um, so for those just joining us, again, feel free to ask any questions to our students, either directly or in the chat, whatever you feel most comfortable with. I'm going to start out by just asking a few questions. And as I mentioned, this really, I want to focus on the transition into medical school, either coming from that undergraduate environment or Isaac, you had mentioned, and Shonda, that graduate environment. Um, one thing that I think a lot of people hear is that the transition to medical school can be really difficult. It can be demanding. It can be rigorous. And I was wondering if we could just talk a little bit about your transition into medical school, maybe what you experienced coming into Kent, Kent State as a first year medical student in terms of the community that you experienced or even the support services. And I don't know if anybody wants to take the lead on that first one. I, oh, oh, Holly, I saw you. I saw you on mute first. I'll let you go first, Holly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yes, it's definitely demanding. It is difficult. And having never done a master's or anything above undergrad, it was a really big switch and it took some getting used to for sure. Um, I think one of the best things you can do is reach out to your classmates, reach out to the staff at Kent State faculty admissions. Everyone is there. They want to see you succeed. They want to help you get to where you need to be. At the end of the day, we're all here to be doctors and everyone wants us or wants to see us become doctors. Um, we have really awesome services like with uh, Teresa for mental health. Um, we have counseling, um, psychiatry and um, just like general care through case. Um, that was really helpful. And then I feel like just the bond that you make with your classmates and the other people in the school above you, it really is the best thing you can do because we've all been there. We know what it's like. We know <laughs> tips and tricks to get you through it. Thanks, Holly. Gabby, did you want to go next? Yeah. So for me, 
so everything Holly said was like definitely like amazing. We do have all those services that you guys can reach out to for any kind of support. Um, but for me, transitioning into medical school was very difficult because when I was in undergrad, COVID hit my junior year. So that every, like, obviously no one knew how to like deal with it. No one of my professors knew. So like, I was just chilling, laying back. Just like, oh, this is easy. Like June, the rest of junior year and senior year, I see some laughing. So I think they agreed that we were just chilling. Everything was fine. Senior year came. Oh, this is so easy. Not because I like knew it, but because like it was all online. So I was like, oh, I don't have to study as much as like I normally do because everything's online and everything's good. And then reality hit me when I got into my first semester here and it was no joke. It, they really do say it's like drinking from a, like a fire hydrant. And I had to switch back my brain from pre-COVID to be like, okay, Gabby, yeah, you got to buckle down and th you actually have to study now. This is no joke. This is not undergrad during COVID. You are learning how to be a doctor. So for me, first semester was just a big trial and error of how to study, how not to study. And now second semester, everything is coming better to me. I'm doing better on exams because I used first semester as my trial and error. So it's no joke. Don't take it as this is going to be a breeze because it's not. You really have to study hard if you don't want to, if you want to do good in your classes. That's great. I do want to spend some time talking about the fall semester and the courses that you take and kind of get into a little bit of the weeds about what consumed a lot of your time. Um, Shonda or Isaac, do you guys have any comments about the transition that you wanted to add in before I get into the coursework? Um, sure, I can say something. Um, <laughs> the reason why I'm laughing is because everyone speaks about how difficult medical school is. And even when you go through a master's program, you expect to be like, hey, like I should be fine. That was not the case. <laughs> um, regardless that you get that graduate education, it's still like drinking from a fire hose, as Gabby said, right? And fire hydrant rather. And because it's so much information and, and juggling that information can be difficult. Um, so at times you, you kind of look back and you're like, hey, like, I went through a master's program, I should be prepared for this. I don't feel prepared for this, but medical school is something that is difficult for everyone. And it trains you and it teaches you how to prepare for the following semester. So just like everyone else said, they had to change their learning style. So I had to truly understand how I receive information and how I can be able to prepare myself for my coursework, which was really good because now I'm in my second semester and I'm doing much better than I did in my first semester. I'm managing my stress a lot better. I'm doing exceptionally well in my classes. And that's because I was able to alter how I studied and the things that I used to do that used to work for this semester. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, Paul asked a great question, but I think I want to talk about the fall semester and kind of outline the coursework that you encountered uh, fall semester. I, I know we want to talk about gross anatomy, but would anybody be able to go through the course lineup fall semester just so that our incoming students and prospective students have a feel for what they would take in those 23 credits? Yeah, I actually wrote them down so I can do that. Perfect, Shonda. Um, so first year in the fall, you take cell and tissue, um, which is kind of a mixture of biochemistry and histology. Um, research methods, embryology, upper extremity anatomy, staying alive, medical ethics, medical genetics, and then podiatry professionalism and society. Um, I don't know, was it about 20 credits? And then in the spring you take 28, so it's more than you'd ever take in undergrad. <laughs> Um, I want to ask the group, what class do you feel like consumed the most of your time fall semester? Which one did you have to work the hardest in? Gross. Anatomy. 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 <laughs> Absolutely. We hear you all. Okay, perfect. So gross anatomy is an eight credit course that everyone takes that you hit the ground running. I think first week you're in anatomy lab, you are dissecting with the scalpel in hand. What surprised you the most about that course? Um... I, I can speak on that. I'm yeah. not sure my peers. I know some of my peers got a little bit of experience of anatomy. I never took anatomy before. So uh, it was an overwhelming amount of information all at once. Um, and so I had to try to decipher that information, which was really difficult for me. But ultimately what I understood is that we have so much tutoring first and foremost, 
that is given to us by upperclassmen. So that helped me through anatomy, learning how to study for gross. Um, it's a lot of information, so you got to work on it every single day. Um, the thing that surprised me the most probably was the fact that I thought, I originally, originally I thought I was like, I'm not going to get good at this. It's just so much stuff. It's, it's difficult to understand. And eventually by the second exam cycle, I'm like, hey, I'm getting a catch of this and I'm understanding this. So I think the big thing with anatomy is repetition and consistency. And so that helped me out quite a bit. And Holly is my pod mate, so she can speak about that, um, how much we used to like try to quiz each other while we're dissecting and stuff of that sort. Um, but yeah, that was probably like the biggest thing for me when it came to anatomy. Absolutely. I think I, you know, you, you brought up pods and that's something I did want to touch on because that's something that you guys um, are assigned to either the first week of classes orientation, you, you find pod mates very quickly. You guys are assigned into pods and that becomes a group that you work with in anatomy and some other courses. So could somebody spend some time talking about pods, what that looks like, how you guys interact together uh, in the first semester. I can grab that one if that's okay. Um, so typically as a first year, you're placed into a pod with three to four other first years. Um, and for the most part, you'll spend your time with your pod in dissection for the cadaveric studies um, within the lab, but also for genetics, you'll do a pod related um, essay type assignment, you do um, quizzes and cell and tissue together that are group based quizzes. So um, for me, I was a collegiate athlete. And so, um, and that's not a brag, that's just saying like, I had a team of people to go into school with and automatically make friends. And that's one thing oh, I really it. loved about Kent. Yeah, it was because that, you know, you go in and you have this pod to immediately connect with. So if you're a little bit more shy or introverted, you immediately have people that the school has already placed you in a setting with. So if you guys have any more questions, just let me know. No, that's great, Shonda. Thank you for that explanation. Um, we talked about gross anatomy really consuming the most of your time. On an average week, how many hours would you think you would spend on campus, maybe studying? And then we'll get to Paula's question about like, what do you do if you have a free moment <laughs> and how much free time do you get? I can, oh. <laughs> oh, Holly, you yeah. got it first. You got it first. You we're on the same wavelength. <laughs> you know, we're just want to answer the same question. Yeah. You go first though, and I'll piggyback. Okay, sounds good. Um, so my first semester, I studied a lot at home. Um, I know some people have preferences studying at home, studying at local libraries, studying at school. I, in undergrad, studied at home. Like I didn't go out. I was a hermit. I stayed in my dorm. I went to the lounges. I just stayed in my little area. And I was like, I can do this in med school. It's going to be fine. I was very wrong. Um, when I moved here, I got a dog and I moved in with my boyfriend. So there were plenty of distractions. I would study for half an hour. And, oh, my dog needs to go for a walk. Oh, I need to let my dog out. Oh, I need to go cook lunch or grab a snack. And it was way too many distractions. I was procrastinating. I got behind on lectures because there's a million things to do at home except studying. Um, so this semester I switched to studying at the school. My productivity has like skyrocketed. I don't have distractions. I can't go downstairs and hang out with my dog for an hour, <laughs> which sad, but for the better. Um, so I am usually at the school at around 8 a.m. and I will stay until about four or five, depending on the day. Um, I like to watch classes on BoxCast, which we might get into later. Um, so I'll watch them on double time speed and I'll get through them in half the time. But I like being able to pause, break stuff down, take notes and stuff like that. So that takes up the majority of my day. And then on Mondays and Wednesdays, we also have anatomy lab. Um, and from one to four this semester, we're in the lab dissecting. So although you are dissecting and it is like class time, you're still learning so much. And like Isaac mentioned in our pod, um, usually we'll have like, our pod is three. We have a small pod, <laughs> but we'll usually have two people dissecting and then one person will be quizzing the other or asking questions. Like we would get asked on quizzes um, or stuff from the book and it like helps solidify just the combination of seeing it in front of you, having your hands on it, and then having to think through the systems and the attachments and actions of all the muscles. But anyways, I got a little off topic there. <laughs> um, so most of the time I'm at the school from like eight to five. Sorry, I just 
No, you it's like a full time job. <laughs> I, I perspective. It, it feels like you're going to work every day. I'm yeah, sure. yeah. And that's something that I kind of struggled coming out of undergrad. I was like, oh, I can go to lecture 10 to 12 and I don't have to do anything else for the rest of the day. But here, like you need to be in school mode eight to five. And if you don't finish, you need to keep working. You can't just go home and be done if you're behind. Excellent. And Gabby, you were going to tackle that next. I want to ask if you have a day off during the week. Do you take days off for studying just to kind of just, you know, put the books behind for a moment or are you on it every day? Um, no, I'm not on it every okay. day. Oh my gosh, no. Are you kidding? No, I need breaks. So usually after exam cycles are over, I take like one to two days to just chill, hang out, you know, maybe do like a tiny bit, like an hour of something. But other than that, no, after exam cycles, it just drains the life out of me. And I need some like rest. But I want to go back to what Holly was saying, because she was saying that, like, she likes to study at the school. I do not like to study at the school at all, which is fine. Everyone studies differently. Some might do better studying at the school. Some might do better studying at home. I'm really used to studying at home at the school. I feel like I can get nothing done, which is like weird because going into med school, I was like, I'm going to spend 24 seven at the school. I tried that the first week. It was like, no, I cannot do this. I cannot stay here for that long. So I mostly study at home and I only go on campus. If I need to go do a quiz exam, um, dissection in the lab or um, tutoring. So I like, I'm more productive at home, which is fine. Everyone has their own way of studying. So there's no wrong way of studying at all. But yeah, I study about, try to wake up really early. I'm just a really early morning person. So I'll wake up around six and then, you know, watch some YouTube videos. I'm like, whatever I'm watching that day, like YouTubers though, nothing school related. And then seven o'clock comes and then I, you know, sit down and actually get work done until about nine o'clock nine o'clock is like my cutoff maybe 10 if it's like right before an exam but then nine o'clock is my relaxation time where I watch my housewives in New Jersey and turn my brain off for the night I love it so adaptability <laughs> and bravo are the keys to success I can stay perfect um I you, you said two things Holly and Gabby that I wanted to come back to um one I wanted to talk about box cast and it wasn't something I had initially thought about but it is something you know everybody has a different learning style and some people really need to be in the classrooms and other people really resonate with watching it online later double speed things like that could could somebody address what box cast is and how you use it okay um, we can talk about that a bit. Well, BoxCast is pretty much our recorded system that allows us to go back to lectures that are recorded live. Um, and so you have access to these lectures all the time. You can watch them live, you can watch them later, you can watch them, sometimes you can watch some lectures earlier, um, just based on the previous years. Sometimes the material is not that different, like anatomy, the material is going to be the same typically. So you can go back and watch those type of videos. Um, personally, I like to be in class. I'm the guy that's always in the video asking questions. Um, so people always be like, hey, I can hear your voice in the video. Like you're always asking the question, but that's just how I learned. At times I do need to go back on BoxCast because I'll miss it, miss it while I'm in lecture. And so that kind of helps solidify like the material. Um, and sometimes if I'm not feeling like coming to class, typically I'm at school. I know everyone is like eight to five. I can be at school sometimes from eight to like midnight just depending on how I want to, how much stuff I want to review. Um, not everyone is like that. I don't suggest that for everybody, but um, I also do take long breaks um, in between studying. So everyone is different. And um, as far as like the material goes, as far as getting back to BoxCast, um, mm -hmm. the one thing that I think we all love about it is the fact that you can two times speed it, like Holly said, which means you can get through the lecture in half the time um, sometimes that works in some classes you got to pause, you know, go back and kind of review what the lecturer said, and that kind of helps a lot too. No, that's great. Um, the one question I think Holly or Gabby, you brought this up was exam weeks. 
Gabby, I think you might have said that. Could you talk about the structure? Because you guys are in lecture and lab for a period of time, and then you have a week, a week and a half where you're solely focused on exams. Could you describe that, um, Gabby, in a little bit more detail so somebody would know what to expect about what a typical exam schedule would look like? Yeah, so I could touch on our first exam week ever. During the first semester, it was very intense and nothing like I've ever been a part of before. It was a wonderful experience. We had ethics on a Friday and then we had the weekend. And then Monday we had our first, it was cells and tissues, right? Any nods? Yes, yes. Holly, maybe. Cells and tissues was on a Monday. We had Tuesday off. Wednesday was our anatomy exam. So how our anatomy exam goes is that half of it is lecture portion. So it's all multiple choice on the computer. And then we have our laboratory practical, which is in the lab, 60 seconds per station. And then the next day was Thursday. So then we had genetics exam. And then Friday was our embryo exam. So first exam week was very, very, very intense. It was just like one after the other. You got to make sure you don't get behind in studying for one class you have on another day. And it was just a lot. And it was not my best exam cycle because I was very like, what am I even doing? Like, I don't even know how to study, make sure I have everything taken care of at one time. But as it goes on, you get better at um, managing your time and being like, okay, even though this exam is like the last day of the week, I can't put it off. I need to start doing a little bit, at least like an hour every day. So by the time it's like the day before the exam, I could just pound out all these lectures and study and study and study review. And then by the time you get to that exam, you're good, hopefully. I mean, it's just like, don't take the first exam week as like, if you do not as good as you think you are, don't think you're like doomed for the rest of your semester. It's just, you learn from it. You can't just give up after the first exam cycle and be like, oh my gosh, this is not for me. I can't even do good on one exam. That's not the case. They have tutors and you can, you can get help to do better. It's okay. You'll learn from it. Don't, don't, don't be afraid of it. You just gotta, you got to go through it and you're going to be okay. Yeah, no, that's great, Gabby. I think a lot of students who are admitted to medical school, some, some cases you've never faced academic adversity. So I think that first exam cycle hits really hard in some cases, but it's, it's always about humbling. round two. Yeah, round two, round three. Um, I want to jump ahead a little bit. You mentioned, uh, and your group was a little bit interesting in that you guys experienced the end of undergrad or your master's program during COVID, which is very different than maybe a traditional environment. But I know that studying tactics that might have worked in undergrad may not work in professional school. Could you talk about how you had to change? Like what, what worked for you in undergrad and maybe why it's not working in professional school and what tactics you use at Kent State that have really resonated and made you successful? I can speak on that. <laughs> I smile because uh, my friends call me the paper boy. Okay. And the reason why they call me that is because I take reams of white paper and I rewrite lectures from like the beginning to the end. Okay. And some people don't understand it, but that's how I like kind of conceptualize things. And I talk to myself as I'm writing. I never used to do that in undergrad, not even in my master's program. I loved my iPad. I would have the time to be able to redraw notes. And I used to be a drawer, so I would draw notes on the iPad and make it look all pretty and nice. But once you get into med school, you understand your time is very valuable. Um, so you're trying to make the most use of your time. Some people don't think rewriting lectures is use of their time. For me, it helps me remember it because um, I remember the color that I used to write um, that material with. So that helped me out. Um, and some people, like I said, in the beginning, uh, some people were like, hey, maybe you should try BossCast because everyone loves BossCast. But I realized for me, I'd rather be in lecture. Um, I'd rather ask the question as soon as it's out. I'd rather um, sit right in front of the professor, right in the front row, um, and you know, ask the questions that I need the answering to. So studying tactics definitely changed quite a bit after the first exam cycle, as Gabby said. It is stressful. So if you don't do that great on the first exam cycle, do not give up. 
because we can all attest that we got better as time went on. <laughs> we knew exactly what to do. <laughs> we knew how to manage our time, how to study efficiently, and we have great tutors. Excellent, excellent. Um, before, I, I do wanna talk about tutoring. Does anybody wanna share any tactics that have worked for you in your first semester leading into your second semester that you would share with an incoming student or a prospective student? Anything specific that you wanna add in? Are you talking about like studying techniques? Yeah, like I feel like I always see the Anki decks come through. Like I'm wondering if there's specific things that maybe really resonate for certain courses that have made you successful that we can clue in everybody who's here <laughs> about maybe what really worked for anatomy or genetics, something like that. I don't use Anki or Quiz. Oh, okay. I know. What? I know. I know. It's so bad. I don't use Anki or Quizlet. I know it's so bad. So I just like to find a lot of practice quizzes online. Okay. Like if we're learning about, I don't even know, like the brain or something, like some specific part of the brain, like the hippocampus. I'll go on to Google, be like quizzes on the hippocampus and then just do quizzes like that. And then because I live at home with my parents, I have a built-in study buddy with my mom. So I make her quiz me every night when she's free. And I'll like, if she's busy, I'll bring my cat up into my room and pretend I'm teaching my cat about, I don't know, anatomy or something. <laughs> so I just talk out loud and just talking out loud. I, I, I know a lot of people do that. A lot of people are like, pretend you're teaching somebody. If it's your cat or if it's like your calendar on your wall, like as long as you're saying it out loud, if you can explain it good, that's how it helps me to learn. But I know I don't use Anki or Quizlet. I'm sorry, Holly. No. I just got, I don't know how. That's judgment. crazy. <laughs> I know. Holly's judging me. I do not use Quizlet or Anki. I use my cat and my mom. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Holly, could you talk yeah, to I'm us about how too. you survive without Gabby's mom? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. No judgment because I know there's like a heated debate on Anki, Quizlet, or other things. Um, I think that Anki is like the holy grail of studying. That is like 98% of my studying. I seriously do not know what I would have done if nobody told me about Anki. I have a sticker that says Anki University because I would not survive without it. So it's essentially um, like a flashcard app and it has, I forget what the name of it is, but it has an algorithm that brings back like cards with spaced repetition. Um, so say for example, you're doing anatomy and you have card, you can make your own cards or people will hand cards down to you. Um, and you can do like a photo and then like put boxes on the photo for like labels. And then it'll like quiz you on what the label is. And then you can say if you knew it right away, if you didn't know it at all, or if you were somewhere in between. And based on how well you knew the answer, that's when it'll give you that same question back. So if you knew it right away, it's not gonna give you that question for like 15, 20, 30 minutes, or even the next day. Um, and then if you didn't know it at all, it might give it to you again in two minutes. And so you can just sit here and I'll just sit here and press my space bar all day long <laughs> and do Anki cards. Um, and I have like different sets for each class. And then I make a different deck for each lecture or each topic. Um, so I'll have like 500 cards on the brain, like we talked about. Um, and then maybe I wanna move over to genetics and I have cards on, oh gosh, I don't know, different diseases and stuff. Um, or you can like take the professor's notes and you can like close out words or statements. And so kind of what Isaac does with writing out the lecture, like you can go word for word what the professor says and quiz yourself on all of the material. That's great, thank you, Holly. Shonda, have you experienced or have found anything that really works for you that maybe didn't work um, in undergrad or even your master's program? Yeah, I think during undergrad, I was pretty passive with my learning is the best way to put it. Like I would read through the textbook and the professor's notes um, and I could kind of get away with that. And now that I'm here, I have to be very interactive. So I have to be listening to the lecture. I have to write it out. I have to read it, say it out loud. I have to watch accessory videos on it or go to the textbook. And as soon as I find that I'm zoning out, I have to switch it up because you, like Isaac said, you can't waste your time. So you're constantly trying to reflect and find something that you're actually retaining the information through. Um, so that's worked really well for me. 
during the transition. And um, I think something else too is Quizlet. I know a lot of people use Anki. I like Quizlet personally because I don't have to make the cards. I don't know if Anki does this, but I know for Quizlet, there's a lot of older students who have made amazing Quizlet de decks. So I'll just go through and steal theirs basically um, and utilize those. And there's a learn setting that basically makes practice tests for you and whatnot. And that's been really helpful, but I also hand write out all of my notes and that works for me. Excellent. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead Isaac. Um, so yeah, um, actually a lot of upperclassmen make a lot of Anki decks. And Gina has a ton. Gina is one of the people who will be in educational resources, a person you'll speak to when you need tutoring or resources of that sort. She has a ton of Anki decks. Um, and also there's this thing about Anki. The one thing I love about Anki is that you can convert Quizlet into Anki. There we go. Tip of the day. Thank you, Isaac. Isaac, I wanted to expand on something you mentioned earlier and then you just brought it up. Um, one thing that some students may not take advantage of in undergrad is tutoring services. It might be the exception in undergrad, and I want to say it's kind of the standard in professional school. And I think our educational resource office, Gina and her team of tutors do an exceptional job in providing services to students. Could anybody speak to the tutoring available to students as a first year? Who's taking advantage of it? Why you should take advantage of it? Isaac, you're shaking. Do you want to start your... Yeah, um, so tutoring saved me when it came to <laughs> understanding all of my classes. I went from, you know, passing or doing okay and barely passing to doing really well and exceptionally well. Um, tutoring was something that I knew I needed from day one after like I saw like the first week of school and I was like, whoa, there is so much like stuff I have to like actually study. And I was sitting in my room one day on a Saturday morning, I'm like, I'm actually about to study all day today and tomorrow. No, I need to get tutored. And literally on Monday, I went to go and ask Gina for a tutor. And um, she, you know, pretty much helped me out with that and assigned me a one-on-one -on -one tutor. There's also a lot of group tutoring when it comes to anatomy. Like I said before, I never, you know, did anything when it comes to cadavers or anything like that prior to. Um, and so I needed more assistance when it came to identifying certain um, you know, muscles or nerves and vasculature, things of that sort. So I got a lot of assistance through that when it came to tutoring. And because the tutoring sessions are at different times throughout the week, I could go to more than one. And um, in these groups, I was able to pick up something that I didn't know the day before or reinforce something at the end of the week, uh, which I probably studied maybe on Monday or Tuesday. And I'll come in on a Friday for group tutoring and I'll be like, oh, that's what they meant when they said, you know, X, Y, and Z. Um, so that was pretty helpful. Um, I think often at times we like questions because questions help us think about the material that we need to go over. And so we also have tutors who literally just are designed for lectures. So they create a lot of questions, tons of questions, questions that they've probably seen before. And our tutors are second years, people who've already been through the classwork. So they're creating questions for us to kind of get our minds going to help stimulate, you know, and understand what the material that it is that we need to take from it. Great. Thank you, Isaac. Um, and I just want to remind anybody joining us, feel free to jump in, ask any questions, or if you feel more comfortable, feel free to ask in the chat. Um, in addition well, to the, oh, yes, absolutely, Gabby. Sorry. So absolutely. I, don't know, I don't know if anyone remembers Holly, I think it was Holly talking about um, pod groups that we were assigned. Was that you, Holly? Or no? I think no, it was Shonda. Oh, Shonda, sorry, Shonda. <laughs> okay, Shonda was the one to talk about pod groups for like anatomy. So also every pod group in anatomy gets assigned a table tutor and you have that specific table tutor to teach you. It doesn't mean that you have to go to them. If you want a different table tutor, you can always ask Gina, but my table tutor saved my life. I love doing one-on-one -on -one tutoring. I don't like being in a big group because then people might like scream out the answer and I'll be like, wait, did I know that? Or like, am I just thinking I know that because someone else said it? So I like being one-on-one -on -one or maybe me and one other person. And the tutor just points up, I'll be like, what's the insertion? What's the origin? What's the nerve? And then if I know it, I know it. If I don't, at least I know that I don't know it. So yes, every pod group does get assigned a table tutor. That does not mean that they can be your only table tutor. 
throughout the whole year. I know some people have a second year table tutor and then also get tutored by a third or fourth year. So also just wanted to add that in real quick. No, oh, that's great, Gabby. And I think with anatomy, you really do need all the help you can get. We were talking about this earlier today. You know, medical school is so hard and you want everyone on your team that you can get. You need everybody there supporting you. So making sure that you take advantage of those resources is really, really important. Um, I wanted to ask beyond tutoring and the TAs and everybody available to you, I wanted to ask if you've seen support from some of your faculty members in the first year fall semester. And if somebody could talk a little bit about faculty members and how they might have supported you in the fall semester. I'll jump on this. I've had so many faculty support me. In fact, I got sick and Carla supported me and ran out the same day um, to, and was asking all week how I was doing and if I was okay or not. Um, but when I first started school, I, I'd been out of college for three years. So I was super intimidated by financial aid and Kathy walked me through the whole process. Um, I got engaged recently. So I've been planning my wedding with David. Um, yeah, I'm very excited. Um, so, oh, thank you. Um, so I've been planning my wedding with David. So I was like, when the heck am I supposed to plan a wedding when I'm in podiatry medical school? So um, he's been helping me with that, just figuring out the scheduling and what works best. And then um, I also went to Gina because I wasn't happy with my first round of exam scores. So I said, hey, what can I do better? How can you help me out? And I don't think that I ever had to wait more than a day for any of these people to get back and um, be ready to help me out. So I really love that about the school. I can't say enough good things about how the faculty has supported us. And Lori and Carla, you guys are always putting out cookies and goodies for us. You remember <laughs> nothing else. I want you to remember that we give you free things. Thank they give us cookies, okay? <laughs> that should be enough. No, that's great. Angela was the faculty member that I would close the door and be like, hey, Angela, today's been a rough day. <laughs> you got this, Isaac, you got this. <laughs> and would keep pushing me. Um, I think everyone at Ken is awesome. Everyone has an open door policy. You can go and speak to anybody. Um, and that's the great environment that we have at Kent. Like we're literally a family. Like I can go next door and go talk to Kathy. Like, hey, Kathy, I'm really having trouble with you know my financial aid. I don't know what's happening. And she'll give me the rundown of what I need to do immediately. Um, I can go and talk to Carla. Hey, Carla, I was thinking about doing this. Is this okay? Carla, like, hey, like, yes. Let's think about this. Let's work this out. You know, and everyone is just great when it comes to that regard. Even my professors, they make themselves very available to me. You know, I got some tutoring actually one on one. One of our um, professors, um, Dr. Whittingham, and he would actually meet with me on a Sunday morning, and he would just tutor me through some of the lectures in biochemistry, and you know, that was really helpful. So, like I said, everyone here is available to you. There is nothing that you should feel intimidated about. Uh, faculty is great. You know, other students that you might need help from are great. You can literally walk down the hall and just say hi to anyone. Everyone's gonna say hi back to you. If you need help, like literally a second year you walk past, they might just say, hey, aren't you a first year? Yeah, I am. How are you doing? Literally, that's the environment we have here at Kent. So it's awesome. Oh, I wanna say something too. I'm not, I swear to you, I'm not just saying this because y'all are in the chat, but Carla, and Angela are literally the best people you will ever meet at Kent State, I swear to you. Carla and Angela were helping me before my application even got sent to Kent State. I was emailing Carla and be like, I don't know what it's gonna come in yet. Like, I'm stressing Carla and be like, we are just waiting for your application, no worries. Don't be stressed out. And her and Angela were just helping me so much during my application process. And also Angela's cool because I was really lazy and didn't wanna walk up four flights of stairs and she let me on the elevator. So <laughs> thanks Angela. No, Angela truly is the best. I feel like she's helpful and your best hype girl. So I feel like now- Oh my gosh, yeah. I literally put it in her office and I said, Angela, I do not want to walk up flight of stairs. Can you just please let me on the elevator? And she's like, okay. And then she let me on the elevator. <laughs> don't tell anyone though. I don't want her to get in trouble. This is recorded, Gabby, but that's all right. <laughs> no, that's perfect. I really appreciate that perspective. And even what you shared, Isaac, about Tim Whittingham, I feel like he is every year. I feel like he's, uh, nominated or wins like best faculty member. And he's somebody who really stands out, who's always there to support students year in and year out. So I'm so glad to hear about that experience as well. Um, I have like maybe a two part question. I, maybe what advice would you give to somebody coming into Kent State as a first year student? And then what mistakes did you make that you would help them avoid? Uh, 
<laughs> I'm really bad at this. <laughs> Hallie, you go um, first. I can take the first chunk of that, maybe right. the advice. Nice. Great. Um, we could go on and on and on, I feel like, on all these different topics. Um, but I think the biggest thing that I can say is take care of yourself. I did not do that. <laughs> and I really regretted it. Um, there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of emotion. It's it's difficult the first couple of weeks to kind of figure out what's going to work for you and what doesn't work for you. And I think one of the best things that I have started doing now that I didn't do my first semester was just take a couple hours on the weekend, take an hour a day and just decompress, let it out, drink some wine, watch some Love is Blind on Netflix, <laughs> binge some shows, like really take care of your mental, physical and emotional self. Um, Freshman 15 was very real in undergrad, and I think freshman or first year 20 is very real here. <laughs> I really appreciate the cookies <laughs> that we get, but they've taken their toll. I think I've lost some hair. I've gained some weight, but we're here now. We're back in the gym. We're working on it. We have all that support around here. So definitely take that time for yourself. <laughs> No, that's great advice, Holly. I want to come back to that after we hear from some of the other panelists about advice and mistakes that you would want others to avoid. Um, don't do what I did and start panicking and be at school till midnight every single day and not take a break and not let your brain rest so you can actually digest the material because you're going to burn yourself out. And that's typically what happens to people. You know, you feel like you're getting burnt out, you start getting stressed. So you Instead of taking the second to give yourself a, a release of that stress, you, you know, overwork. So um, first round of exams was a wake up call for me. I realized I was at school way too much. I didn't do the things I love to do, which is going to the gym, you know, playing basketball with my friends, just doing things like that. And after I started implementing those things, I realized that my productivity actually went up a lot more. So instead of panicking, you know, my friends always say, number one thing, don't panic. <laughs> and that's our thing. You start panicking and you start getting anxious. You start feeling, hey, I have so much stuff to do. You know, oh, I, I didn't watch this lecture today. Oh, now I have like two or three lectures. Relax. You're going to get through the material. You are very capable of getting through the material and you're going to be just fine. I love that. That's wonderful, Isaac. I love that you are capable. And I think that's something that everybody needs to keep in mind. If they're here, you are capable. Um, I think that's fantastic. Shonda and Gabby, anything to add to this section? I, Shonda, do you, do you want to say something? Oh, you want to go first? You can go first. Sure. Um, I was just going to say in terms of um, advice, just be, being self-reflective, I think that's kind of the point of what we're all saying here is you constantly have to ask yourself, did this work for me? Did this not work? What is my goal? And if you didn't achieve what you wanted, then go back and say, how can I learn from this? Don't freak out and make sure you're taking care of yourself. I think that's super vital that Holly said that. And then um, mistakes. I know you had asked about that, Carla. Mistakes for me was that I tried too many resources. Um, you are given the lecture on BoxCast. You're given it over Canvas on a PowerPoint. Um, you have the textbook. You have um, tons of study guides that your big brother and big sister, I don't think we've discussed that, another support that Kent State gives you at orientation um, through a second year that you're paired with to give you resources, but um, you get a lot of material and you have access to a lot of material. So focus on what the teacher gives you, um, use the other things ex as accessories if you need to, but don't try to memorize every single paper that you're given or you'll be completely overwhelmed. <laughs> Oh, that's great advice. Great advice. Gabby, did you want to finish up this section? Yeah. So mistakes I made was being really, really hard on myself and just putting myself down. Like if I didn't do good on an exam or for me first semester, it was a lot more exams than I wanted to not do good on. I would just be like, why? Like you got into medical school. Isn't this what you want to do? Shouldn't you be good at this stuff? And it's like, uh, no, I needed to adjust. I've never done anything like this ever in my entire life so just remember to take it easy on yourself not everyone gets into medical school or ends up where you are so give yourself more credit you know like it's okay if things don't go your way at first you just have to learn from it and be like okay well what can I do to improve or like what did I learn from that I think Shonda or Isaac had mentioned before and then another thing is that just don't try not to compare yourself to people 
imposter syndrome is a real thing yeah isaac's like yes imposter syndrome it's it's totally real i know it's hard to be like oh don't compare yourself and then you're like oh yeah okay i'm not going to compare myself but then if you hear someone being like i got a 90 on that exam and you're like how did i get like a 75 like what are they doing that i'm not everyone goes their own pace everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses they might be really good in one class and then you might excel them in another class like there's no reason to compare to other people compare yourself to one exam like oh i got this grade on the first exam i want to compare that and be better on the final so just it's okay don't compare yourself and take it easy on yourself and take lots and lots of mental breaks because you're going to need it in medical school that's good advice, Gabby. Give yourself some grace. Excellent. Um, Shonda, I, could you talk a little bit about big brother, big sister? Because that's really important and I didn't have it in my notes. Could you just address that and how that all goes down that first week of school? Yeah, so when you come to orientation, um, you'll be paired with a second year and they'll be called your big brother, or big sister. And typically throughout the year, they'll share resources with you. Mine did the same day that I met him. Um, and they'll share a folder with you of what they used, what worked for them. And then throughout the year, they'll just kind of check in on you and say, hey, are you doing okay? How did your exam go? What can I help you with? What resources do you need? Um, and if you're struggling, they'll ask if you need to hang out or if you need something else. So. Uh, it's been fantastic, very supportive, very encouraging, and um, I'm excited to be one of you guys next year. So just to piggyback on that as well, yes, bigs are great, and we are assigned bigs, so we do get them at the start of orientation, but I've also been adopted by many people, <laughs> so I have a lot of adopted bigs, um, big brothers, big sisters, and it's awesome. That's why I say Kent is like a family, like, um, I have a third year big, I have a fourth year big, like, it's not just, oh, you're assigned a big and hey, like, you know, you can get all the resources like Shonda told you, you can get a, a massive amount of resources. And at times it is difficult to kind of siphon between the resources you're going to use, but I always revert back to what the lecture, the professor has given you. Excellent. No, I'm, I'm excited that you have so many adoptive bigs. That's wonderful. I think there's some, um, sometimes you hear about medical school being so cutthroat. And, and it's not to say that Kent State's not competitive, but I think more often than not, you see the collaboration versus the competition. And I think that's really important. Going back, you really need everybody in your corner when you go through this. Um, I want to end with one last question from my side, and then certainly we'll feel free to open it up. Anybody can ask any questions. Certainly do it in the chat if you feel more comfortable. Um, but for those, Gabby, you're from Northeast Ohio to, to some extent, but from those who aren't from Northeast Ohio or coming from Chicago, could you talk a little bit about your transition to Cleveland and what you kind of appreciate now that you're being here? Maybe some things that you didn't expect coming to Cleveland. Um, not going to lie. I, I came from a major city, a big city where I grew up from, and I still love Chicago, love it to my heart. Um, it's kind of like um, going from a big city to a smaller city, but it's more of a homey city. I, I was a little sad. I was like, I'm gonna miss my family. I'm gonna miss the, the big buildings, but I came to realize like, I really do like it that it's a lot quieter. <laughs> I can have access to all the things I want without having to go a million miles away. Um, and there are many areas of this, like outside of the city the major city that I can go hiking and, you know, go and hang out with friends, sightseeing. Um, and these were things that were kind of surprising to me at first. Um, and I kind of acclimated and got adjusted to that. And I realized that I really do like Cleveland. Perfect, thank you, Isaac. Um, well, I want to open up to any of the guests uh, who logged on. If anybody has any questions for any of our pa panelists, Gabby, Holly, Shonda, or Isaac, feel free to ask, or if you want, uh, you can certainly put it in the chat. The one thing I might ask our panelists to do, if you don't mind, in the chat, could you guys put your email addresses? That way, if a, an attendee has a question that maybe is specifically geared for you, they could reach out specifically to you with that question if they feel more comfortable doing so. Thank you, Gabby. To answer Angela's question, my favorite restaurant is Antonio's Pizza. Ooh. And as a true Italian, Antonio's Pizza is very, very good. 
That's a helpful tip. That's good. <laughs> um, I really like, uh, oh man, Shonda, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I really like the rail. Um, I think it is a chain. So I think there are some other ones around, but they have the best burgers and the best fried pickles I've ever had. <laughs> Holly, what was it called again? The rail. The rail. Yeah. Excellent. Shonda, how about you? Uh, my favorite restaurant here is Canteen. It's a little um, like gastro pub here in Broadview Heights, but they have such good food. Um, which, by the way, if anyone's looking for a place to live, I highly recommend Broadview Heights. It's such a cute, friendly area. I really love the community. Um, and then someone asked in the chat about the grading system. Most of the classes are A through C. You have to pass. And then there's like one or two that we've taken so far that are pass fail. Um, so there's no plus minus. It's just A, B, C, and then occasionally the curve like you may have seen in undergrad if you know the course that per is performing poorly or something so well that's very helpful um again feel free to ask any questions one thing i i noted is that you talked about taking time for yourself i think holly you mentioned that um i know some of you participate in sports and shonda running and things like that what do you guys do to relieve stress i watch housewives okay the housewives yes me and you are very similar yeah <laughs> that's how i relieve stress is i watch housewives of new jersey with my cat, <laughs> like an old cat lady i'm a nerd so i watch anime okay excellent i watch tiktok <laughs> i love it i love it I kind of like getting out and about. So like we go to the art museums, the botanical garden. I really want to go to the zoo this summer. Um, there's a little arcade nearby at a saloon called Wild Eagle. And we just love to go and play the games. So um, and escape rooms. There's a really good escape room place in Strongsville that I'd highly recommend. So excellent. And Adam, I'm so excited. You Sorry, Carla. I was just going to tell Shana, the zoo is free on Mondays, the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo. Yeah. It's the greatest Thank you. Love yeah, it. and the Cleveland Art Museum has free admission. But also, can I answer Adam's? Yeah, no, Adam has a great question. And Adam is a member of 2026. So this will be a really helpful resource. And Gabby has props. So this will be wonderful. <laughs> Your iPad will literally be your Bible or whatever you believe in. This iPad is your holy grail. Isaac's got your iPad. Anyone else got your iPad out? Show it. This is the best. I do not own an iPad. Okay. Well, that's okay. iPads are literally will be your best friend. You could upload all your PowerPoints on here. You could write on it. There's some Shonda the Rebel. Um, you could have, there's two different note apps people use. There's Good Notes and Notability. I'm a Good Notes. I don't know who else is Good Notes here. Oh, Notability. Holly, are you Notability too? Oh, God, you guys know Good Notes. It's too note, bright, but yeah, Notability is where it's at. Oh, Good Notes is my good favorite. Notes. I bought both of them. You do have to pay for them. And I bought Notability too, and I don't use it. So kind of a waste of money, but it's fine. Um, you can write on it. You can just upload the slideshows from Canvas, which is what we use to get all of our notes and get our grades um, Canvas. You can upload all your PowerPoints on Go no Good Notes or Notability. And you can highlight it, take notes. So like how I usually do it is I have my MacBook from undergrad and then I'll put BoxCast on it. And then I have the PowerPoint already up on my iPad and I will take usually the verbal notes. Like if the professor is saying something that is not on the PowerPoint slide, I will write that down and you can use a bunch of different colors. You can highlight it. iPad is a very, very good investment. I cannot hype the iPad enough for med students. Okay, there, my rant is over. Just the <laughs> iPads are the best. No, it sounds like it's really useful. So that's great. Shonda, what do you use? Just paper and pencil. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so we're covered. That's perfect. That was a great question, Adam. Oh, and also noise canceling headphones. Oh. Voice canceling headphones, either over the ear. I love my AirPods, but I also have over the ear Beats as well. Yeah, I have both. I I keep it with me everywhere. 
Um, and oh, the Anki app. Okay. Don't let's not forget the Anki app. You do have to pay for it, but I have it on my phone. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. I could be uh, literally watching a TV show, but I have it on my phone, just going through Anki. I can go to the bathroom, be using Anki. I could walk through campus just to try to get to a meeting, going through Anki. Mm -hmm. And it just helps because it's constant stimulation. So literally be walking around campus and still be studying. And don't forget the pencil for your iPad. You need that. I also want to say real quick, Anki, I know someone has their hand up for a question, but Anki, and I can't believe I know this because I don't use Anki, but Anki, I believe is free on the computer. And I'm getting heads, yes. So yes, Anki as an app, you pay for it, but on the computer, it's free. Excellent, thank you, Gabby. Um, I wanna turn it over, Hafsa has a question. Hafsa, I'm so glad you're here. Hi, Carla, so nice to be here. Absolutely, um, what kind of question did you have? So I, I had a question about the Anki. So someone said that, um, I think it was Holly, she said that she makes her Anki, while Isaac said that there are pre-made decks that you can use. So I just wanted to know that there are pre-made decks that we can use because time is a, a resource in medical school. I don't want to be sitting around making like 500 cards if that's an option so if anyone can talk about that yeah um so you can find cards online you can get cards from your big from upperclassmen i like making my own cards because that forces me to read the notes read the books and understand the material while i'm making cards i know it's not everyone's cup of tea um, but when I'm going through like our anatomy notes, I will literally copy and paste it in there. And then I'll, as I'm reading it, I'm like, okay, do I understand this? Do I understand that? What part do I want to quiz myself on? Um, the first semester I used, or the first exam cycle, I used other people's Anki and it was helpful, but it's like, oh, I wish I would have also like occluded this word or occluded this word or just like bordered it a different way. So I like making it to my, I don't know, I don't think I have high standards, but I'm very picky. Um, and I think that going through the material multiple times helps me understand it better. Um, Thank you. No problem, just piggyback off of that. Um, I'm a people person, so I talk to everybody. Like literally everyone knows, like I, I talk a lot and I talk to everyone, I'm very friendly. So I ask people about their Ankis. Hey, you got Anki, you have an Anki for this class, you have an Anki for this, and I compare them. So I will go through the deck, I'll browse through the deck myself and I'll be like, hey, I like this one a little better. I like the style of how they've included some stuff. It may work for me and I'll just adopt it. Um, I have a really good friend um, that she literally will go through lecture and she will type up her own Anki. And there's nothing wrong with that. She says it helps her study. It helps her get through it. It helps her understand the material better. For me, I just feel like I was just, I, it didn't work for me. I have to write it out on paper to understand it and talk to myself out loud. And I'll use Anki as a reinforcement um, type of uh, system. So there are pre-made decks. Like I said, Gina does have a lot, actually educational resources. And one day you'll see me in the halls and I can share that with you one day. Hopefully you come to Kent and yeah. Thank you. I, and I am coming to Kent, so I'll see you. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I feel Apps is going to seek you guys out. I love it. I feel like this yeah. is wonderful. Get those Anki decks ready. I love it. Yep. Thank you, guys. Um, wonderful. Well, it is 8 o'clock. I want to open up any last minute questions for our panelists, for those who are here. Um, and I'll add, well, if anybody wants to add anything in the chat. I did record this, so we'll go ahead and send this out to anybody who maybe joined mid um mid recording we'll go ahead and send this out that way you have it or you can refer back to it and here's some pearls or some mistakes that you can avoid moving forward it could be any question too it doesn't have to be school related it could be about the area about cleveland literally anything it doesn't have to be just school related absolutely and i'll ask our panelists do you guys have any closing comments anything that you want to add before we wrap up i love being a golden flash I love Kent State. That's it. I don't know. It's just a great school. I love it. I love all my friends I met there. These people, the people you meet here are going to be with you for the next four years, possibly going through the hardest part of your life. Like this is not easy. Not everyone does this. So these people you really form a bond with. And I'm so grateful I met the people I did while I was in school here. 
Excellent. Excellent. Hafsa, I see your hand up. So I want to see if I can, or if our panelists can answer one question for you. Yeah, just a quick one. So I know it's going to be really hard. It's going to be difficult. Uh, but if we are doing whatever we can, are we going to survive the first semester? <laughs> That's my concern. Yes. Concern. yes. Absolutely. Yes. You're going to okay. do great. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Trust me, I have friends who have families, they have children. I have friends who are, Shonda is engaged. I have friends who, who have, you know, dogs and, you know, their pet families. I, I have a tortoise, that's what I have. So I talk to my tortoise. There's so many things that all of us are doing. Uh, a lot of us are actually now involved in different clubs. We've taken on extra roles. Next year, we're gonna be tutors. You can get through it. I think it's all about, having a good system in place. Kent already kind of gives you a framework and you can always ask us about anything. Like, hey, I didn't do so well on this. Is there anything that you can offer me? Maybe you can help me out, try to look over this. And if we're tutors, more than likely, we can give you that assistance. Thank you. Excellent. Um, sweet, sweet Paula asked about the weather in Ohio, and I feel like it will be a, a rough transition initially, but I think we have so many students who come from um, southern states and Puerto Rico who do have um, maybe a slight transition getting used to it, but then more often than not, I think you grow to love the cold weather. I think it you can appreciate the time that you get to spend inside studying. You don't have to worry about <laughs> that nice sunshine uh, in January. <laughs> I think one of my favorite things is that we get all four seasons here. So it's really cold and snowy in the winter, but we also get really nice hot summers. So you get a little of everything. Yeah, yeah. during this time is where you're really rolling dice with weather because a couple of days ago it was like what high 50s and now it's going to snow at the end of the week. So just this time of year, you never know what you're going to get in Ohio. If you're going to be wearing shorts and a t shirt or your winter coat. Yeah. And just to go back to what Carla said about people coming from different places, a uh, really good friend of mine came from Florida. She had to adjust to the weather, but she's adjusted now. She knows exactly what she's doing. My good friend Imani Well came from Puerto Rico and he's doing great. Like he doesn't really mind the weather. He's doing just fine. So like it's an adjustment. I came from Chicago, so I'm used to this cold weather, snow, you know, trust me, it's it's all good. And then I'll just ask address one question about the scholarships. Um, there are scholarships offered internally through the school. And then I think what we're seeing is more and more external organizations within podiatry are opening up scholarship opportunities. Right now, it seems to be hitting our third and fourth year students in particular, but I think that's an area that's going to increase. So hopefully there will even be more opportunities down the line through APMA, ACFAS, um, and then even state organizations like the Michigan um, Podiatric Medical Association is building one. We do have a few through the Ohio one, but I think it's only growing. So hopefully that expands as well. Yes, Michigan, you'll be fine. <laughs> Perfect. Um, well, I think at this point, what I'll do is I will thank our panelists so, so much for your time and all your insights into your first semester and then some um, at Kent State. And certainly thank all of our attendees for coming and spending an hour with us. Feel free to reach out to Holly or Shonda, Isaac or Gabby if you have specific questions. And then Angela and I can be reached um, very easily at Podiatry at Kent State. Even if you're feeling low, Angela will hype you up. So just feel free to Podiatry at Kent State. She'll give you what you need. But I want to thank you all again for joining us. I hope you all have a great night.